Hey everybody, welcome to day three of the Throne of Eldraine set review here on the Mandalik. I'm John as always, and today we're going to take a look at every single black card in Throne of Eldraine. Of course, we're going to be looking at this from a limited perspective. We're talking draft, we're talking sealed, we're not talking any of the constructed formats or anything like that. Remember, these are my first approach to these cards. Ratings may change over time, but this is how I recommend that you approach cards uh, at pre-release and at your first few weeks of draft. And of course, I want to hear your thoughts down in the comments below. Talk with me, talk with each other about uh, the cards in this set, because they're all pretty nifty. But let's jump on into the first card with Ayara, first of Lockthwain. Ayara is black, black, black for a legendary creature elf noble at rare. She's a 2-3. Whenever Ayara, first of Lockthwain, or another black creature enters the battlefield under your control, each opponent loses one life and you gain one life. Tap, sacrifice another black creature, draw a card. She seems very solid. A 2-3 three for 3 that's very hard to cast doesn't exactly excite me. And draining 1 doesn't terribly either. But if you're in a heavy black creature deck, draining on every black creature? Now that's very decent. And then sacking the worthless ones for a card will also be very decent. I'm not sure that this really creeps above the B level, but if you're in a heavy black deck, it'll probably just edge up to a B plus. Some very real value can be had here. Like with the other triple colored cards, uh, both in this set and back in M19 or M20, you should remember that if black is kind of a secondary color, if you have like seven swamps, you got a question about including this. You probably still include a Yara, a Yara just because she has some very good value, but you got to be careful on your mana bases a little bit when we start getting into triple pipped cards. But a B for a Yara. Up next is Bacon to a Pie. Bacon to a Pie is two black black for an instant at common. Destroy target creature create a food token at sorcery speed this would be a premium first pick removal spell just like impale was at instant speed this is incredible this is the first pick in the vast majority of packs that it's in the only thing you're picking over this is some sort of game ending bomb rare every other time you're picking bacon to a pie. Absolutely fantastic card. Just a little tiny bit of extra bonus with that food token. Uh, but this is the premium yest of removal spells. A. Solid A. Up next is Barrow Witches. Barrow Witches is four and a black for a creature human warlock at common. It's a three four. When Barrow Witches enters the battlefield, return target knight card from your graveyard to your hand. Yeah, five mana for a three four is a pretty tall ask. If you are definitely in the knight's deck, I think you probably just have better cards. Five is just way too much of an ask here. Uh, I think if you are in the knight's deck, if you definitely have a whole great big bunch of them and they are going to be returning a card, this is maybe like a C. I think you still look to cut it if you can find better cards. And if you are not knight heavy, I think this is way more like a C minus or even into the D range. Uh, it's just really over costed for what it does. So a C if you're knightly and less if you're not. Up next is Bell of the Brawl, a fantastic name for a card. Bell of the Brawl is two and a black for a creature human knighted on common. She's a 3-2 with menace. Whenever Bell of the Brawl attacks, other knights you control get plus one plus O oh until end of turn. A 3-2 menace for three is great. We've had that before with Boggart Brute, and it was always a very solid card, both when the tribe mattered and when it didn't. Having the bonus of battle crying your other knights is just gravy. Very solid C+. Plus probably even creeps up to the B- minus range in a knight-heavy deck. Uh, this is a very, very, very good card. You'll play it in every black deck, and if you are one of the knight's decks, it's going to be even better. B- minus for Bell of the Brawl. Black Lance Paragon is up next. Black Lance Paragon is one and a black for a creature human knight at rare. It's a 3-1 with flash. When Black Lance Paragon enters the battlefield, target knight gains death touch and lifelink until end of turn. This card's great. It's like a super ambush viper. Uh, more power. It gets lifelink as well. And it could just give those abilities to another knight instead if you do want to keep this 3-1 around. This is basically removal. It is conditional that it's in combat, but... 
it might leave behind a relevant body. I think it's a very strong B and likely the first pick in uh, uh, many packs that it's in. I'd rather have bacon to a pie, sure, but this card's still very good. Solid B for Black Lance Paragon. Up next is Bognati. Bognati is three black black for a creature fairy at Uncommon. It's a 3-3 with flying, and you can play, pay two and a black, sacrifice a food to give target creature minus three, minus three until end of turn. This isn't too bad by itself as a five mana 3-3 three, three flyer. You know, that's an okay card. It's a little bit overcosted, but a uh, 3-3 three, three flyer is nothing to, uh, to cough at. If you do have some food, or even better, are in the food deck, which is black green, then this becomes great. Killing things with food is definitely a lot better than just gaining three life off of it. Seems like a strong card. Probably could be the first pick if there's no bombs or removal, um, but it is a, a weaker first pick, I would think. Uh, B minus for Bognati. I think it's very good. Uh, uh, playable if you have no food as kind of a filler creature, and if you do have food production, very solid. B minus for Bognati. Up next is Cauldron Familiar. Cauldron Familiar is a single black mana for a creature cat at Uncommon. It's a 1-1. One, one. When Cauldron Familiar enters the battlefield, each opponent loses one life and you gain one life. Sacrifice a food. Return Cauldron Familiar from your graveyard to the battlefield. 1-1 uh, one, one Drain 1 is not impactful enough for me to want to play it. Sacking a food to recur it? I'm still not a huge fan here, but if you do have some sort of serious food production going on and you can absolutely definitely do this a number of times, then it becomes somewhat interesting to me. As is, though, I'm going to start pretty low on this and wait to see the, if this is actually a viable thing. Uh, I feel like we've seen a lot of 1-1 cats that if you just put a whole bunch of resources into them, they might have de done something, like Dreadmulkin, for example, and they never were actually very good. So I'm going to start this at the C- minus range. I'll keep an eye on it. If food production can just go crazy and you can return this over and over and over, sure. But I think the, the, the actual problem here is going to be getting this back into your graveyard reliably. So C- minus for Cauldron Familiar. I'll keep an eye on it, but I've been burned by 1-1s for 1 that you have to put a bunch of resources into to actually make them good. Up next is the Cauldron of Eternity. The Cauldron of Eternity is 10 black black for a legendary artifact at Mythic, but this spell costs two less to cast for each creature card in your graveyard. Whenever a creature you control dies, put it on the bottom of its owner's library. Pay two and a black tap and pay two life. Return target creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield. Activate this ability only any time you could cast a sorcery spell. This is a weird card, and I'm simply going to have to see how it played to figure it out. Obviously, the cost is ridiculous, but with only a little bit of work, it does become a much more reasonable six-ish or maybe even lower mana. Then you get to return some creatures to the battlefield, but only once because should they die again, they don't go back to your graveyard. They go to the bottom of the deck. I think my problem here is figuring out the play pattern. You'll want to have a lot of creatures in your graveyard, both to have this be cheap and to have targets once it's down, but getting a lot of creatures into the graveyard typically isn't quite as easy as you think in most limited sets. If you drop this with only three creatures in the yard, which already gives it quite a big uh, discount in casting cost, you'll get some value and, and hopefully some decent value, but then it's gone after those three creatures have been returned. Pairing this with self mill is obviously kind of the best idea here, but I'm curious just how easy that will be to come together. I'll keep my eye on this because I think this card could easily run the gambit from way too janky to be playable to actually just straight up super powerful. My grade? I don't know. I don't know. F to A? I don't know. I'll have to play with it. And to be honest, I, I don't know that the floor is actually an F, because if you do get three creatures back off of this, that's probably fine. Uh, I think, of course, it does also depend on how good those creatures are. If they're your, your one drop, your two drop, and your three drop that died, well, they're probably not that impactful later in the game. Uh, but yeah, we'll, we'll see how this card goes. I'm excited to give it a try, because I don't know. Cauldron's Gift is up next. Cauldron's Gift is four and a black for a sorcery at uncommon. It has adamant if at least three black mana was spent to cast this spell. Put the top four cards of your library into your graveyard. Then, regardless of if you 
paid a whole bunch of black or not, you may choose a creature card in your graveyard. If you do, return it to the battlefield with an additional plus one, plus one counter on it. Look, some self-mill to help you out if you happen to have a reason to want to do that. Five mana is a lot if you're spinning the wheel without a target already there. But if you do have a target there already and could potentially upgrade if you do pay the extra black to mill, uh, then five mana for a return to the battlefield isn't too bad. I actually love this effect, but I find it never plays quite as well as I want it to. You can't just guarantee you'll have something worth five mana in your graveyard with consistency. You'll probably usually have a target, but if that target's a two drop, well, it's not worth paying five mana for. And so I think that consistency is why these effects are never quite as amazing as they should be. Still, I want it to be good, even though there is that randomness built into it from game to game. So I'll keep this at a cautious B minus. Uh, keep in mind as well, it's only as good as your deck is. If you have several bombs, this card probably gets quite a bit better. If you are, you know, a low curve aggro deck, now, this card's probably way less because returning a 2-2 to the battlefield just isn't going to be that good. So let's go with a cautious B- on Cauldron's Gift. I want this effect to be good. Hopefully it'll be good. We'll see how it is. Up next is Clack Bridge Troll. Clack Bridge Troll is 3 black black for a creature troll at rare. It's an 8-8 eight, eight Trample Haste. Yikes. When Clack Bridge Troll enters the battlefield, target opponent creates three O1 white goat creature tokens. At the beginning of combat on your turn, any opponent may sacrifice a creature. If a player does, tap Clack Bridge Troll. You gain three life and you draw a card. This is insane. I saw somebody say, I, I think they clarified it as being a hot take that this would be as good as Desecration Demon. This is insane compared to Desecration Demon. Desecration Demon got a, a counter on it, and sure, it was a flyer and still eventually just took over the game, but this is already an 8-8. It has Trample, and you gain three life and draw a card when they sack a creature? This thing is insane. Just a, a slam dunk bomb here. You know, like, yeah, your opponent gets three goats that they can sacrifice, which means they have three turns of turning this off. But, oh no, the horror, you gain nine life and draw three cards over those three turns. And then they still have to deal with the 8-8 trample with a reduced board state and now have to sacrifice their real creatures. This is a snap first pick. It's an easy bomb. It's a solid A+. Clackbridge Troll, please be in every pack I ever open. Epic Downfall is up next. Epic Downfall is one in a black for a sorcery at uncommon. Exile target creature with converted mana cost three or greater. This seems nuts. Like two mana to kill probably anything you care about. You can't kill a two drop or a one drop. Oh no, whatever will you do? Obviously not being an instant kind of sucks, but at this point it's is pretty darn close to Doomblade. Doomblade was instant, but Doomblade didn't hit black creatures, so you know, trade-offs. This is an easy A for me. It's the first pick in most packs that it's in. Uh, you take this over bacon to a pie every time. Up next is Eye Collector. Eye Collector is a single black mana for a creature fairy at common. It's a 1-1 one -one flyer. Whenever Eye Collector deals combat damage to a player, each player puts the top card of their library into their graveyard. Uh, meh. It's a 1-1 one -one flyer for one, which is something I'm not a fan of, and the ability isn't that impactful. There's obviously some synergies like the cards that care about seven cards in your opponent's graveyard or the self-mill, but I... I feel like there's so many more impactful cards you could play rather than this. I think it's super cuttable. I think you should generally just not play it. If you desperately need to be getting cards into people's graveyards, I guess. But I'm going to keep this at a D. There's very specific cases where you should actually play this card. Festive Funeral is up next. Festive Funeral is four and a black for an instant at common. Target creature gets minus X, minus X until end of turn, where X is the number of cards in your graveyard. Hey, look, a reason why you would want to self-mill. Uh, five mana is a tall ask for what could be a somewhat inconsistent effect. This being common helps that point, I think. Uh, you know, if this was always going to kill everything, this card would probably be uncommon. So I'd, I'd be careful thinking of this as just being unconditional removal all the time. Still, there's definitely some ways to bin cards in this format. We, we've seen some 
eye collector, for example. So I'll keep an eye on this, but I'm going to start low in like the B minus range because it is removal, but it's inconsistent removal, but you can build a deck that hopefully takes advantage of it to make it more consistent. But even in that case, you have to draw the cards that makes it consistent. So we'll see. We'll see. I've got it at a B minus. I don't want to load up on these. I'd be super hesitant about getting two of these in my deck or three of these in my deck because, you know, I draw these. I don't draw my way to mill stuff and I just suddenly have dead cards in my hand. Yeah, we'll see. B minus to start with Festive Funeral. You obviously need to make sure that you are making this worth it. Up next is Forboding Fruit. Forboding Fruit is two and a black for a sorcery at common. Target player draws two cards and loses two life. Adamant, if at least three black mana was spent to cast this spell, create a food token. This is sign in blood, more or less. It's it's not black black, it's two and a black instead, so it's kind of like read the bones, I suppose, but you know, it's in that family of cards. If you've not played with this family of cards, they're totally fine. They're totally solid. Uh, paying two life to draw two cards, that's fine. This is divination. Two life is easily worth two cards. Plus, you get that food token if you do pay black, black, black for this. And the cool thing about Sign and Blood and stuff like this is it says target player. If your opponent's at two, they're dead. This is a shock in black. It's obviously not a shock because it can't hit creatures, but you get what I'm saying. This card's solid. If you haven't played with this type of card before, don't sleep on this. This is a C plus. I would love one of these in every single black deck easily. And if I happen to be black green and want a lot of food, well, here's a bonus. C plus for foreboding fruit. Up next is forever young. I want to be forever young. Forever young is one in a black for a sorcery at common. It says put any number of target creature cards from your graveyard on top of your library. Draw a card. Uh, I didn't like this when it was called Grave Purge in Dragons of Tarkir and it cost three mana. And I know that it was also called Footbottom Feast from Lorwyn, but I've only drafted that set once, so I don't know how good it was there. I, I don't like this here when it costs two mana, I don't think. The effect is pretty meh and it feels very inconsistent. In a game where not a lot of creatures died, this card's really bad. Next game, everything died, well, the card's way better, which is the hallmark of a card that I tend to avoid pretty heavily. I want my cards to be consistent. I want them to do the same thing game after game after game after game. Um, if you are heavily into self-mill, this maybe gets better, but typically you're in self-mill because you want those cards in your graveyard. You want to be recurring them. You need them in your graveyard for something like Festive Funeral. So pulling them back out of your graveyard onto the top of your deck where you now have to draw them one a turn-ish is kind of against what your deck is doing. So... I don't know. I'm not a huge fan of this. I have it as a D. I do think there are decks where you can probably get consistent enough value out of this. M maybe? And the fact that it's two mana as opposed to the previous versions being three mana is uh, uh, decent as well. We'll see. I'll keep an eye on it. could be uh, that I'm completely wrong about this, but I'm going to start it at a D. I've seen this effect and it hasn't been that good before. Foul Mire Knight is up next. Foul Mire Knight is a single black mana for a creature zombie knight at Uncommon. It's a 1 1 with Death Touch, but it can take an adventure first. The adventure is Profane Insight, which is 2 and a black for an instant adventure. You draw a card and you lose 1 life. Uh, this card's great. It's a 1 1 Death Toucher for 1, which is relevant basically any point in the game, so I don't really feel forced between having to decide whether or not to adventure first. I'll adventure this basically always. Even if I have it in my hand turn 1 with a black mana, I'm still probably going to hold on to it for the adventure. That 1 1 Death Toucher is not typically as important in the early game. The adventure is solid. Instant speed, draw a card, lose a life, totally fine. And then you get that Typhoid Rat after with a relevant creature type, which is just great. I think this is a strong card. It's not exactly a first pick that I'd be happy about, but it is a very high one. Uh, B minus for Foulmire Knight. Up next is Giant Skewer. Giant Skewer is one in a black for an artifact equipment at common. Equipped creature gets plus two, plus one. Whenever equipped creature deals combat damage to a creature, create a food token. Equip three. 
Five mana to get this onto the first creature is a lot, and unlike the equipment that we've seen back in blue and white, this one doesn't have an auto-equip option, um, so, so it's just too pricey for my blood. Good equipment needs cheap equip costs, which this doesn't have, or super powerful effects, which this doesn't have. Getting a food because you hit a creature isn't really that great. I'll be avoiding playing this as much as possible. It's not 100% unplayable, but I'd strongly recommend against it. Uh, D- minus for Giant's Skewer. Up next is Lash of Thorns. Lash of Thorns is a single black mana for an instant at common target creature gets plus two plus one and gains death touch until end of turn. It's a combat trick. It's not terribly exciting. Being death touchy means that it is probably removal, but people I find often think of these effects too much as removal. Think Blade Brand, for example. You must have a creature that can block. You must have this card. You must be able to cast it. There's a lot of ifs there. They're not hard ifs to get, but there are a lot of them. So Lash of Thorns is just a combat trick to me. I'm not going to put it into removal range. I'm just going to keep it at the C level. I will not play this if I just have better cards. I will not feel awful if I play it, but it's not a card that gets an auto include in any of my decks. So just a C for Lash of Thorns. Up next is Lockthwain Paladin. Lockthwain Paladin is three and a black for a creature human knight at common. It's a three two with menace. It's got adamant if at least three black mana was spent to cast this spell. Lockthwain Paladin enters the battlefield with a plus one plus one counter on it. A three two menace for four is less than ideal. We're used to that being three even in this set, even in this color. But if you're heavy black and you can pretty reasonably make this a four three, it's totally fine. Only really pushes into C plus territory if you're in a deck though I think otherwise I think it's a, a, a C play it cut it whatever up next is Lost Legion. Lost Legion is one black black for a creature spirit knight at common it's a 2-3 when Lost Legion enters the battlefield scry 2 3 mana 2-3 scry 2 relevant creature type totally fine filler. You'll play this, you won't feel bad, but I don't think it's an auto-include either. It's just a super middle-of-the-road C. Uh, just a C for Lost Legion. Malevolent Noble is up next. Malevolent Noble is one and a black for a creature human noble at common. It's a 2-2. Two -two. Pay two and sacrifice an artifact or another creature. Put a plus one plus one counter on Malevolent Noble. It obviously wouldn't matter too much if it could sacrifice itself. Not interested in this card at all uh you might remember dread Melkin from uh war of the spark i think war of the spark where you could sacrifice a creature planeswalker and get two counters on it and it was not good it was it was, it was not good at all uh, a two two for two that gets one counter for sacrificing another creature or an artifact is not good either this is super 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 filler um if this was back in the days where two twos for two were a solid C. This would be a solid C. It wouldn't even go up to a C plus, I don't think. Um, but these days, this is a C minus. You should actively try to not play this card. If you need a creature, sure, but try not to play it. C minus for Malevolent Noble. Up next is Memory Theft. Memory Theft is two and a black for a sorcery at common. Target opponent reveals their hand. You choose a non-land card from it. That player discards that card. You may put a card that has an adventure that player owns from exile into that player's graveyard. No, 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 no. We'll talk about this again very shortly in this set review, but thought seize effects, duress effects, etc. just aren't that good in limited. Most limited decks, 90% of a limited deck sucks. <laughs> it's mediocre cards and lands. There's typically only a couple of cards that you're actually really happy to uh, thought seize away, and you're just unlikely to hit them. The odds are very not in your favor to successfully do that. And then being in that scenario where your opponent has an adventure creature and hasn't yet cast it from exile, it's just all super low. This is a, a D minus. You should not be main decking this card ever. There's very narrow cases where you would ever consider citing this in. Basically, if there's a card that you can't deal with in any other way, you can side this in and hope that you get lucky and draw this and cast this before they cast it. Uh, not a good card. D minus. You will win a million more games if you just never play this card. D minus for memory theft. Up next is Murderous Rider. Murderous Rider is one black black for a creature zombie knight at rare. It's a 2-3 with lifelink. When Murderous Rider dies, put it on the bottom of its owner's library. It can go on an adventure 
called Swift End. Swift End is one black black for an instant adventure. Destroy target creature or planeswalker. You lose two life. Obviously, the adventure is the big part of this card. Instant speed, three mana, mostly unconditional removal. Because uh, if you're at two life, you shouldn't cast this. You can, but you shouldn't. But basically unconditional. Then you get a 2-3 lifelinker for 3, which is a totally okay filler level creature. Uh, the put it on the bottom of your library is obviously a downside so that you can't recur the adventure over and over, but this is removal, great removal, and the bonus creature attached uh, is just gravy. Uh, a solid first pick A here for A for Murderous Rider. Up next is Oath Sworn Knight. Oath Sworn Knight is one black black for a creature human knight at rare. It's a zero zero, but Oath Sworn Knight enters the battlefield with four plus one plus one counters on it. Oath Sworn Knight attacks each combat if able. If damage would be dealt to Oath Sworn Knight while well, it has a plus one plus one counter on it, prevent that damage and remove a plus one plus one counter from it. This is obviously the Black Knight from Quest for the Holy Grail. It has four limbs and it doesn't stop attacking until all four limbs have been taken off. It seems decent. It's a 4-4 four, for four, 3 that must attack. What else are you going to do with it? And it's kind of hard to kill. Great. Uh, unfortunately, this likely doesn't end games that well. A single chump on that 4-4 four, four makes it a 3-3, three, three, which is much more reasonable to deal with. The next chump block, or, or potentially even just block block, makes it a 2-2, two, two, which at that point, oh, it's not really that impactful. So... The relevant creature type might help this out a little bit, maybe buffing it somehow uh, with another knight, but I think ultimately this just isn't a bomb, it's just a good creature. I think it's in like the B- minus range, it could be in the B range if you are somehow giving this menace or first strike or something, uh, some sort of knight bonus from uh, uh, the other black knights or white knights or red knights. Um, but yeah, I'm going to keep this at the B minus range. I'm definitely taking removal over it. And if there's some like super balmy, amazing uncommon creature, I could maybe see taking it over Oath Sworn Knight as well. Um, very cool card, very funny card based on the, uh, the reference. Uh, but I do think it is just kind of in the B minus range. B minus for Oath Sworn Knight. Order of Midnight is up next. Order of Midnight is one and a black for a creature human knight at uncommon. It's a 2-2 two -two with flying and Order of Midnight can't block, but it can go on and adventure. The adventure is Alter Fate, one and a black for a sorcery adventure. Return target creature card from your graveyard to your hand. I like this. I like this a lot. A 2-mana two 2-2 two -two flyer that can't block isn't really a downside. You typically want to attack with your flyers all of the time. Uh, I'll jam that creature as soon as I can play it. I'm not going to wait around for the adventure to be relevant, but later in the game, if I do draw it, 4-mana to return a creature and get a 2-2 two -two flyer? That's great. That's just gravy. Uh, this card's just all around good. I'll jam every copy that I can grab. It's not a first pick, but it's pretty darn good. B- minus for Order of Midnight. And actually, I think that might be a little bit too low. Let's go up to a B for it, because it is basically just Gravedigger. Gravedigger was four mana for a 2-2 two -two, uh, return target creature. This is that, except it flies and can't block, which isn't really a big deal. So let's go solid B for Order of Midnight. Piper of the Swarm is up next. Piper of the Swarm is one and a black for a creature human warlock at rare. It's a 1-3. Rats you control have menace. Pay one and a black, tap, create a 1-1 one, one black rat creature token. Pay two black black and tap, sacrifice three rats. Gain control of target creature. So there is a card over in red that makes a couple of rats, but otherwise Piper of the Swarm is really how you're making most of your rats. And this takes a lot. It takes 12 mana and 5 turns to mind control something if you're not also using the Mad Ratter. Um, that's a lot. That's a lot. I think that part is a great if you can do it kind of thing. But the real power here, I think, is just that it's a mana sink and infinite chump block generator. The card's still good. I I'm still probably first picking it a lot. But I don't think I'm picking it over, you know, really good removal. I think you should definitely be considering this as a two mana one three that makes a bunch of chump blockers. If you do get to a point where you happen to be able to mind control something, that's amazing. But I wouldn't expect that to be something that you're doing a ton, and I wouldn't necessarily expect to even get to do it the first time, just because it does take a lot of mana and a lot of turns to actually get there. So I'm gonna put Piper of the Swarm at a B, good card, don't get too best case scenario mentality on this. Uh, you're not stealing things left, right, and center here. Solid B for Piper of the Swarm.
Up next is Rankle, Master of Pranks. Rankle is two black black for a legendary creature fairy rogue at Mythic. It's a 3 3 flying haste. When Rankle, Master of Pranks, deals combat damage to a player, choose any number of each player discards a card, each player loses one life and draws a card, or each player sacrifices a creature. You can pick one, two, or three of those. Despite the weird wording of choose any number, you, you can't pick 732 of these. So the card's good. A 3-3 three, three haste flyer for four is just a great creature. And you can always choose zero. If you have a card, if you have one card and you really don't want to discard it and you really don't want to lose a life and draw a card and let your opponent do that as well. And you don't have a player or you have a, a creature that you don't want to sacrifice. Perhaps you only have rankle down. You can choose zero and you still have a very good creature. But then if you do have those really good scenarios where you're out of cards, you can easily choose to make your opponent discard a card. Um, if you really need to draw a card and you're willing to let your opponent do that too, you can do that. I'm hesitant about that choice. Uh, symmetrical card draw. Uh, it's not something I'm a big fan of. Giving your opponent card advantage is bad. Uh, and each player sacrificing a creature, obviously there's going to be situations where you have a crap creature or a creature that's trapped in a tower or has become a frog, and your opponent has a bomb. And, well, that's a great trade there. So, of course, the choice and the, the power of those choices is extremely scenario dependent. But the fact that you get to pick and choose what you do when, well, that's going to mean that you get to do the best choice every single time. So this card's great. It's an easy first pick. Uh, I don't know that I want to bump it into bomb territory. 3-3 three, three flyer isn't exactly in the bomb territory. And uh, uh, there are going to be scenarios where the, the correct choice is zero as the number so we'll see I, I don't quite think it's an a minus i think it's just a very strong b plus so let's go b plus on rankle master of pranks still definitely a first pick up next is reaper of the night reaper of the night is five black black for a creature specter at common it's a four five whenever reaper of the night attacks if defending player has two or fewer cards in hand it gains flying until end of turn it can go on an adventure first with harvest fear harvest fear is three and a black for a sorcery adventure target opponent discards two cards this this is a lot of mana I'm not a huge fan of a 4-5 for 7. Even if it flies, I'm not really a huge fan of that. And this only flies sometimes. Uh, Harvest Fear is 4 mana for a Mind Rot. I, yeah, no. I, I don't think I'm playing Reaper of the Night. Not in draft anyways. In sealed, which is slower. And opponents have more bombs, which means you're a little bit more likely to hit something good. Uh, I, I think you can probably include this in your sealed deck. But in draft, uh, I'm not really looking to play this. This is so expensive for what it does. Every part of this is overcosted. Um, yeah, I'm not looking to play Reaper of the Night. I think it's a super cuttable. Uh, I'm not even going to go C minus here. I'm going to go with a D. Uh, it's one of those creatures that you really just shouldn't play. A D for Reaper of Night. Up next is Reeve Soul. Reeve Soul is one in a black for a sorcery at common. Destroy target creature with power three or less. Uh, quick aside here. I'm not a big fan of the set design here where we have Reeve Soul and Epic Downfall, both one and a black sorcery spells that do opposite things. One destroys CMC three or greater, and one destroys creature power three or less. Uh, these are going to be very confusing cards. Uh, it kind of reminds me of way back in Cons of Tarkir, there was uh, the mechanic Ferocious, which cared about creatures having four or more power, and then in the same color was a card called Salte Flare, which cared about your creatures having four toughness or greater, and it was very confusing to keep them sorted. I just, I see some cognitive uh, uh, problems that could happen here, some confusion, uh, but the card's great. This is the removal that often looks a little bit crummy because destroy target creature with power three or less isn't that great, uh, but that hits a lot of flyers, a lot of the scary flyers. It kills Rankle, it kills uh, Order of Midnight, etc. And it also kills, and this is the way that I typically like to use Reeve Soul and uh, uh, cards like this, it kills an early threat. If my opponent's being aggressive, they're 2-2 on turn 2 that's going to hit me 2 times or 3 times. 
Well, that's a great target for this to kill. You shouldn't be holding on to Reeve's soul. You shouldn't be uh, uh, saving this for later like you do with a lot of removal. You, sh you should probably use this on the first target that's even vaguely relevant, and uh, it will do work, and it'll be pretty uh, pretty good here. It's obviously not a slam dunk uh, removal spell. Uh, I think I have it at just like a B, B minus or so, uh, because it, it doesn't kill the bombiest of bombs usually, but it's still a pretty solid pick. Uh, I I, I don't think I'd hate first picking this out of some packs if the pack was a little bit weaker. Uh, but yeah, B- minus for Reeve Soul. Uh, F for having this and Epic Downfall in the same set. Up next is Revenge of Ravens. Revenge of Ravens is three and a black for an enchantment at Uncommon. Whenever a creature attacks you or a planeswalker you control, that creature's controller loses one life and you gain one life. I'm torn on this. Uh, this is kind of like Blood Reckoning from M13. It, it made your opponent lose a life. There wasn't the gain a life uh, part of it. And I don't remember Blood Reckoning being that great, but the trick here, of course, is that there's go-wide decks in this format. Uh, Red-white especially is definitely the go-wide color. And that's going to really hurt your opponent if they're losing a life and you're gaining a life. That's a two-point life swing for each creature that attacks. Obviously, the, the problem here is that it does nothing if your opponent's only attacking you with like one or two creatures. They lose two life, but they're attacking you with like four fours or something. And they don't really care that they're losing two life and you're gaining two life because you're also taking eight. Um, so yeah, I... I don't know if I main deck this card or if I side this in when I see uh, the go wide deck. I'm actually going to start on saying that this is a card that you side in when you see those. Perhaps if you are a very late game controlling deck, you just know you're not going to have early interaction. Maybe you can main deck this card, um, but I'm going to start this at like a D plus sideboard card and keep an eye on it because I can definitely see the power but I just don't know how consistently you see that power. So D plus for Revenge of Ravens, and I will keep my eye on it. Up next is Smitten Swordmaster. Smitten Swordmaster is one in a black for a creature human knight at common. It's a 2-1 with lifelink. And an adventure. The adventure is Curry Favor. Curry Favor is a single black mana for a sorcery adventure. You gain X life, and each opponent loses X life, where X is the number of knights you control. This seems all around decent. A 2-1 lifelinker is okay. It's like a C. It's playable. It's not playable. You do you. It's a knight, which is relevant. And obviously, if you're in the knight deck, then the adventure potentially becomes very nice uh, for a single mana. This could potentially be a huge late game draw. If you're shy on knights, this is like a C. And if you're definitely knights, it's a C plus. I, I almost want to give it a B minus, to be honest, because sometimes it says pay one mana, win the game which is very scary at common. Uh, I think if you're heavy knights, you actually want to grab all of these. The fact that it's common as well, meaning that it's uh, it's not going to be terribly uncommon for your opponent to just say, curry favor, take four, curry favor, take four, two mana, eight damage, eight life gain. Uh, yeah, Smitten Swordmaster seems great in that specific deck. I'm actually going to go B minus uh, if you are in the knight deck. And even if you're not, I think it's just a C plus. Spectre's Shriek is up next. Spectre's Shriek is a single black mana for a sorcery at Uncommon. Target opponent reveals their hand. You may choose a non-land card from it. If you do, that player exiles that card. If a non-black card is exiled this way, exile a card from your hand. Thoughtseize is an incredible card for Constructed. It's not actually that good in Limited. Limited decks suck compared to constructed decks your thought sees is typically not favored to actually hit something terribly relevant this one doesn't you know cost you two life to cast it or to resolve it i suppose don't get mad at me about that um but if your opponent's not playing black cards or even if they are but they don't have them in hand you having to exile a card? That's a massive cost. Uh, I'm never playing Sh Spectre Shriek. I've got this at like an F. I, I I guess you could side it in if you wanted to, kind of like you do Duress or Thoughtseize against uh, super powerful bombs that you have no other way of dealing with. But yeah, realistically, I'm never putting this card in my deck. So 
F for Spectre Shriek. The Black Legendary Knight is next, Sir Conrad the Grim. Sir Conrad is 3 black black for a legendary creature human knight at uncommon. He's a 5-4. Whenever another creature dies or a creature card is put into a graveyard from anywhere other than the battlefield or a creature leaves your graveyard, Sir Conrad the Grim deals 1 damage to each opponent. Pay one and a black. Each player puts the top card of their library into their graveyard. A 5-4 for 5 is okay. Uh, I'm not crazy excited by it, but it's totally okay. Dealing a damage, and note that we're back to black dealing damage instead of losing life. I really wish they would just pick a friggin' lane on that. Is really nice. And for 1 and a black, you potentially could do 2 damage here if you milled a creature and your opponent milled a creature as well and it doesn't tap to do the ability which means that this is yet another mana sink in this format i see a lot of actual mana sinks in this format not pay some mana and tap it meaning you can only do it once but do it once twice three times four times at the end of the turn uh really excites me about this format in general and excites me about this card i think it's very good i think it's a strong b um yeah, I'm, I'm going to try it with Sir Conrad a fair bit just because I want to sink mana into it like crazy. Solid B for Sir Conrad the Grim. Up next is Tempting Witch. Tempting Witch is two and a black for a creature, human, warlock at common. It's a 1-3. When Tempting Witch enters the battlefield, create a food token. Pay two, tap, sacrifice a food. Target player loses three life it's the it's the opposite of what food usually does this depends entirely on how good the food deck is i think a one three for three is pretty bad even if it does create that food but if you can over the course of the game sack maybe three food or even more of course then i think this could be pretty decent it's obviously a build around and it's extremely less good if you're not food heavy if you're only getting this one food uh, then i don't think it's worth it so we'll see how it goes i, th I think it's like maybe a c plus build around and otherwise don't really play it up next is wicked guardian wicked guardian is three and a black for a creature human noble at common she's a four two when wicked guardian enters the battlefield you may have it deal two damage to another creature you control if you do draw a card four mana four twos are not something that i'm a fan of they die to one drops and two drops and three drops uh it's it's a lot of mana for a creature that just dies to stuff as well as effects if this draws a card without killing something it's still barely okay and if it does require a creature to die because all you have are x2s ugh, i'm not a fan of this i think we're gonna very actively attempt to not play this uh it's like a very bad c minus uh i i won't drop into a d because sometimes you have to play a 4-2 for 4 but i'd really prefer not to c minus for wicked guardian our second last black card is Wishclaw Talisman. Wishclaw Talisman is one and a black for an artifact at rare. Wishclaw Talisman enters the battlefield with three wish counters on it. Pay one tap, remove a wish counter from Wishclaw Talisman. Search your library for a card, put it into your hand, then shuffle your library. An opponent gains control of Wishclaw Talisman. Activate this ability only during your turn. I don't like tutors in limited because they're usually way too expensive and sorcery speed and the fact that in limited you typically have a few cards that you would absolutely super love to have all the time and the rest of your deck is lands and filler now this obviously can't change that aspect but it is still sorcery speed but it's actually super cheap but your opponent gets to do it once too and they get to do it right away because you can only do this on your turn. Um, so I don't know, I'll have to see how this plays out, but it's obviously very dependent on how good your deck is. If your deck is nuts and your opponent's deck is not, then this card could be pretty good. You get two activations with your crazy deck and they get one activation with their mediocre deck. But it's, it's always hard to know that. It's hard to know just how impactful this is gonna be for your opponent. And so, ah, I don't know. I don't know. You do get two activations out of this versus your opponent's one, but I don't know. I, I avoid tutors and limited, and I don't know that this one is good enough for me to actually jump in on tutors. I'm going to start at a D plus. I'll keep an eye on it, but yeah, I, I've, I've never liked tutors and limited, and I don't think I'll like this one either. D plus for Wishclaw Talisman. 
Remember as well, it's extraordinarily dangerous to think of this as a second copy of your bomb because if you draw your bomb before this, it, it's not a second copy of it. Our final card for black is Witch's Vengeance. Witch's Vengeance is one black black for a sorcery at rare. Creatures of the creature type of your choice get minus three, minus three until end of turn. It's pretty solid. If it kills one creature, it's probably totally worth it at three mana at sorcery speed. If you're lucky and you can actually get multiple things, preferably without killing your things, then I think this is just great. I think it's a decent first pick, but I would still pick a bomb or something more unconditional over it. Uh, minus three, minus three may not kill the scariest things in the format, but it is removal. It's removal for relatively small things and uh, uh, could potentially hit multiple things for one card. So just a, a strong B for Witch's Vengeance. So that's going to wrap it up for Black. Black looks pretty interesting. I really want to try out Sir Conrad and all of the sort of uh, uh, return stuff to the battlefield effects just to see if they're actually good or not, uh, because that's always been one of my favorite effects, and it's frequently not actually worked out that well. Let me know what you're excited by, what you're interested by in black, what cards you agree with, disagree with, talk with me, talk with each other down in the comments below. As always, if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions, you can find me over on Twitter, Twitch, and Facebook. You can find me on patreon.com slash manalink if you want to become a backer there. Patrons are definitely the lifeblood of this channel, so thank you to each and every one of you, and perhaps you could become one too. You can always go over to inkedgaming.com, use the promo code manalink10, all one word, one zero, to get 10% off your order and help the channel out that way. And of course, the easiest, the the cheapest way, the quickest way to help out the channel is thumbs up, like, and share. Thumbs up and like are the same thing. I meant subscribe. But if you do have questions, comments, or suggestions, let me know. Otherwise, I will see you all tomorrow for the Red Set Review.